Part 1 Part 1 You will hear part of a telephone conversation between a job seeker and a recruitment agent. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Yes, so that's Janet Thompson. Would you like me to spell it? If you wouldn't mind, thank you. Just the surname, please. No problem. It's T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N. Great. Now, Janet, before we go through the openings I have here in front of me, might I just take a few more details to complete your profile on my system? Of course. What would you like to know? Well, let's start with your email address, please. OK, janthompson at hort.net. I see. Is that Jan as in J-A-N? No, that wasn't available. I had to make do with J-A-N-N. Here, let me spell it for you again, just to be sure. J-A-N-N-T-H-O-M-P S-O-N, at hort.net. Much obliged. And could I ask, do you have your referee details to hand? Yes, what do you need? I need one work reference and one character reference from a friend or colleague. OK, for a work reference, there's Jane Foote. She's my former boss at Bermuda Girls' School, head of English. OK. My personal referee is Monica Carbody. Mon and I have been best friends since we met in Bermuda in 1991, when she was deputy head of English under Mrs Foote. Perfect. And you mentioned, of course, that you're an English teacher. But are there any additional subjects you're qualified to teach? Yes, I have a diploma in special needs, and I can also do history to GCSE level. Very good. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Do you think I stand a good chance of finding something? Oh, better than good. In fact, we have some positions we can offer you today. You see, it's not so difficult to find a temporary role. Tell you the truth, there are plenty of them around, but getting a permanent position will prove a little more trying, though. Would you be prepared to take up a position short term? Of course, anything that pays. Excellent. Well, there are three positions that I can offer you right now. The first is a teacher of English in LaSalle School. I'm sure you know it, right in the city centre. Yes, near where I live, actually. Even better. Well, it's a six-month contract, and the very attractive thing about this role is that the head of English at LaSalle will, if she's satisfied with your performance after six months, offer to make you a permanent member of staff. Wow, that's food for thought. It certainly is, bearing in mind what I said before about how hard it is to find a permanent role. The second position I have to offer you is in a school near Chelsea. It's called the Chelsea Free School. Are you familiar? I can't say that I've heard of it. Well, this contract is for one year, which is a lot better, looking at it from a short-term job security perspective, than the first role I mentioned. But you also have to realise that you are a temporary replacement for a female teacher who has taken maternity leave. There is no prospect of the position being made permanent. I see. I have one other vacancy at the minute, though I doubt you'll find it quite so appealing. It's situated in rural Cambridgeshire. I'll spell that just in case you want to take it down. C-A-M-B-R-I-D-G-E-S-H-I-R-E. -E. And the school simply goes by the name Cambridge, though it's not in any way related to the other more well-known establishment of the same name. I was just going to ask that. 
What a lovely location, though, eh? Yes, but there's a catch. It's only a six-week contract to cover for someone on extended sick leave. I see. Well, I guess that's ruled out then. What sort of sort of salary can I? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear Dr. Joanna Robinson, the course director of a language learning centre, answering questions from reporters from the student newspaper. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Welcome to the Language Learning Center. I'm Joanne Robinson. You must be the reporters from the Examiner. Please come in and sit down. Hello, Dr. Robinson. Yes, we're from the Examiner. I'm Cheryl Perkins, and this is Don Klim. May I start with a question? Did this college really start with Brazilian students? It did. The Language Learning Center was founded in 1985 to look after a group of students from Brazil who wanted to study here. Those 20 students soon grew to 60, and as you can imagine, we had severe accommodation problems. Somebody said you were in the old amenities block, right near the engineering school. They have a good memory. Yes, we were there because the university hadn't believed we would expand so quickly. The problem wasn't solved until we moved into these new premises in Bancroft House in 1987. When did you start taking students from other countries? About 1990. We now have students from 13 different countries enrolled, and we expect a large group from Turkey next month. Yes, we've noticed a lot more advertisements for Turkish restaurants in our advertising section. Well, 40% of our students come from Turkey, by far the largest single national group and I believe there's been an influx to the rest of the university. There are a lot of Turkish students studying hospitality. Do you offer anything special to the students? Yes, we do. There are several things which make us rather different from other language schools. English is certainly not restricted to English for academic purposes here. Sometimes we have extra classes for students who have particular courses in mind. And we have just said goodbye to a group of 30 Indonesian students who were preparing for a university course in agriculture. They came to us for English for farming, and they were with us for a long time. We miss them. How long do students usually stay at the Language Learning Center? It varies, so I'll talk about the average. Most of our courses last for five weeks, but to make any real progress, a student needs to be here for at least three terms. That's 15 weeks. The students do better if they have a little time to settle in at the beginning of the course, and we offer an orientation course that lasts a week. Most students take it. It helps them to settle down, and it gives us plenty of time to test them and place them at the right level. How many people are in each class? We sometimes go up to 18, but our average class size is 14 students, and some classes have as few as 7 participants. It depends on the needs of the group. You were saying that you miss your students when they go. How do you attract students? I mean, how do they hear about the Language Learning Centre in the first place? We're included in the university advertising and marketing, and we have our own website. The thing which works best for us, though, is word of mouth. Students who leave us often send us their friends. In fact, a student who arrived today was carrying a photograph for me of a former student and his baby. It sounds like a nice place to be. It is. 
A lot of our students make lasting friendships while they're here. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Making friends with other students sounds special enough. I'd like to emphasise that in the student newspaper. We do try to get our students to be part of the wider university. How do you do that? Do you encourage them to join the sports centre, for instance? Indeed we do. The sports centre is always looking for active participants, particularly in soccer. Oh, and something else. You might like to mention that we don't teach just English here. I mean, we're a language center, not an English language center. You may learn Spanish, Mandarin, and Russian here. And we can sometimes offer other languages. This means we can have some students who are native speakers of those languages as conversation partners for English-speaking students. Who can do these courses? At this stage, any native speaker of English. What about the people who are learning English? Can they do a non-English language course? At this time, only if they've almost finished their English language course. You see, we try very hard to involve students who are native speakers of English as conversation leaders, and we encourage our students to join groups on the campus. For instance, if they enjoy music, there is an active jazz group available to everyone, and that's a lot of fun. On the other hand, Elementary students can't go to the drama group. Their English just isn't ready for that sort of activity. But the university choir welcomes all the singers it can find. They often do large productions that need a lot of voices. I imagine the special conversation groups are open to all your students. I wish they were. I'm sorry to say they're a special service we provide for elementary students only. Is there anything else I can tell you? I'd be really pleased if you could write about the courses we offer in foreign languages. I think our readers will be very interested in that. Thank you for your time, Dr. Robinson. Yes, thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about the centre. It's always good to let the rest of the students at the university know what goes on in our classrooms and outside them. After all, many of our students leave us and then study for degrees in various disciplines on this campus. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two business studies students, Evelyn and Mark, preparing for a seminar presentation. Before you hear the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Well, I think the marketing of food would be a good topic. I read a very interesting article the other day about the Canadian food market. Hmm. I suppose everybody's interested in food, even if it's trying not to eat. Why Canada? I know that's where you come from, but isn't it just all North America, really? No. That's why I thought this article was interesting. Although lots of U.S. companies are well established in Canada, and vice versa, there are still subtle differences between the two markets. It says here, the Canadian market is definitely not a northern clone of the U.S. I like that. And 
It says that if you understand these differences, it can have a big impact on successful food marketing. So I know that Canada has a big French speaking population in Quebec. Is this what they're referring to? Not only French and English speakers, there are many different ethnic groups in Canada. It's really quite multicultural. For example, Toronto has large Asian and Italian populations, and Vancouver's got a large Asian population too. And because Canada's population is small, these groups make quite an impact introducing new styles of cooking. So you can see lots of unfamiliar vegetables and things in the markets, and new restaurants are opening every day. It's great if you love trying out new foods, as many people do. Which kinds of food are becoming popular? Well, some Asian food, I'd say, has been popular for quite a while, like Chinese. But now, Southeast Asian restaurants are becoming very fashionable. Then there's Mediterranean, of course, such as Greek, Italian, and so on. But Caribbean and Mexican food is really taking off among young people these days. So, are the supermarkets starting to stock the ingredients that are needed to prepare these foods at home? You know, all those unusual condiments and sauces. Yes, that's right. It's quite interesting going to the supermarket, isn't it? And noticing how they're introducing sections for foods of different nationalities. You can buy quite exotic products locally these days. The article mentioned that 80% of the Canadian retail market is controlled by eight major national supermarket chains, so that when they introduce changes, they can happen quite rapidly. Okay. Well, how are we going to organize this seminar then? I made some notes on the trends in the Canadian market about changing tastes and also patterns for where food is consumed. I thought maybe we could summarize it into a chart or table, and maybe use the overhead projector to present it. Good idea. Maybe I could have a look for similar trends and tastes in Australia and the UK for comparison. Let's have a look at what you found. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now, as the conversation continues, answer questions twenty-six to thirty. The most significant trend, it seemed to me, was that Canadians are definitely interested in healthy food. For example, did you know that salads are the third most commonly eaten food in Canadian restaurants? Really? What about organic food then? Is that becoming more popular? Yes, it's definitely moving into the mainstream compared to a few years ago, and a recent survey showed that four out of five shoppers said that they check the fat and nutritional information on the packet when they're deciding what to buy. What other trends did you find out? There's one change I noticed straight away when I was home last year in the meat department. You know, here the meat packaging says rump steak or four quarter chops and so on. Well, they discovered that most consumers these days didn't know what to do with these roasts and rounds and ribs, so the government approved a new naming system for cuts of meat, which is related to the required cooking technique. What a good idea! I've never really understood the difference between sirloin, rump. Round and all those names. So, how many new categories are there? Eight. There are three kinds of steak: for grilling, for marinating, and for simmering. And then there's what they call quick serve beef, for stir fries, I suppose. And premium oven roast, oven roast, pot roast, and stewing beef. It's a great idea, isn't it? I hope it catches on here. I agree. Any other trends that you thought were significant? Well, what's really interesting is what the article called mobile meals. In other words, more and more Canadians are eating meals away from home, but not just eating more junk food. 
They're projecting a 40% increase in snack food sales over the next three years. And the growth is coming from healthy snacks. You know, the ones that have less cholesterol and fat, such as muesli bars, health food bars, and those types of products. Apparently, in the food marketing jargon, they're called nutritious portable foods, which means healthy snacks. The other major trend is that young people are doing more of the food shopping these days, so marketing has to be aimed more at them, as well as more conventionally at the mother. Thanks, Evelyn. I think we'll have an interesting discussion about these trends and the comparisons with other English-speaking countries. I'll see if I can get some information about them to compare with yours and meet you on Friday to put it together. See you then. Bye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear someone talking about art. Look at questions thirty-one to thirty-five. Listen to the first part and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-five. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the first in this year's series of public lectures offered by the Art Gallery. As chief curator of the gallery, I was given the honour of presenting the first lecture, and let me tell you, I had a difficult time deciding what to talk about tonight. Being the curator, I naturally know just about everything that's in this gallery, but I wanted to choose an artist who has a wide appeal. That seems only fair, yes. But I didn't want to talk about someone so well known that anything I said would be familiar. I wanted someone modern. My personal preference is for modern art. But again, I wanted to choose someone who had the potential to appeal to all art lovers, whether they're attracted to traditional forms, impressionism, surrealism, or what have you. So, having spent the last five years as a visiting professor in Barcelona, it's not surprising that I finally chose to talk about one of the greatest Catalan artists, one whose work is likely to be familiar to many of you. Juan Miro. Look at this, and this, and this. Ring any bells? Miro's most famous and most widely reproduced works tend to be like this: bright primary colors with lots of asymmetrical forms. He painted on large canvases. Larger than himself, quite often, and his paintings depicted birds, trees, flowers, and other features of the natural world. But Miro produced a great variety of work, and it's about some of his lesser-known paintings that I would like to speak this evening. Miro was born in Barcelona in 1893, the son of a goldsmith. He began to show talent very early. And in 1926, went to Paris, where he was drawn to the surrealists of Montparnasse. He did not define himself as a surrealist, however. He preferred to stay free to experiment with other artistic styles as he wished. Miro had an intense dislike of much of the painting and many of the painters he knew. He wished to do something totally different, to express his contempt for bourgeois art. And yet, ironically, 
Miro's success has made his works much in demand among art collectors of the world. But we can't really talk about the artist without looking at his art. And that's what I'd like to do now. To take a look at just a few of Miro's works and think about what it is that makes them special. Special to me and to a great number of people who flock every day to the Miro Foundation in Barcelona. Now look at questions 36 to 40. As the lecture continues, answer questions 36 to 40. Let's start with this. One of Miro's best-known and brightest works, Woman and Bird, a sculpture created in 1982. It is on display in a park in Barcelona, often known as the Juan Miro Park. A huge sculpture, towering up into the sky, it reflects Miro's eternal interest in these themes, as well as his more technical interest in materials. This sculpture is covered in mosaic, which gives it a naive and cheerful appearance. It is interesting that this sculpture was completed in 1982, just a year before Miro's death. I think it shows that, towards the end, he was feeling as playful as a young man. And I think he wanted to share this playfulness in a park on such a big, very public scale. And now, another representation of a woman, this time just called Woman. This was painted in 1976, a late work for Miro, and is a work we often see reproduced or on sale as postcards or posters in gallery shops around the world. So why is it so popular? I think the use of colour has something to do with it. People respond to these rounded shapes filled with primary colours, especially on a large canvas like this. Also, the fact that, while it is rather surreal, it is still possible to recognise the form of a woman and to see it as a sympathetic representation. It's a bold, bright painting and I think that it awakens a reaction in many of us. And finally, something quite different, though still a woman. A harsh, even violent work that was completed in 1939, at a time when Miro was greatly influenced by events of the Civil War in Spain. It's titled Seated Woman Too, but it can be hard to find the woman here as she's been transformed into a rather horrendous creature. So is that how Miro viewed women, as grotesque? Not at all. This picture can also be seen as strong, with a huge base and solid shoulders to support those who depend on her. In this painting, her arms and neck seem to grow as vegetation out of her shoulders, representing woman as a fertile ground, perhaps. We also see here the fish and birds, the moon and stars, so typical of Miro's work, making her a creature of nature and of the heavens as well. And that's all we have time for this evening, I'm afraid. I hope that you've enjoyed this brief look at Miro's work and that you will enjoy the other lectures that follow this one. Thank you and good night. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.